Hello and welcome to EPR with your favorite environmental enthusiasts, Nick and Laura. On today's episode, Laura and I talk about getting experience with technical writing. We talk to Mike Mayer about NAEP, the Endangered Species Act, and he tells maybe the greatest field story we've ever heard. And finally, we also talked a bit about right whales. And here's a cute little note for everyone. Their scientific name, Eubelina glacialis, means good or true whale of ice. You know what, isn't that like the most adorable thing you've ever heard? <laughs> like, I just want to give them a big hug. I know I can't and I shouldn't, but I just want to be like, you guys. They're just like the <laughs> sweet little slow moving whales. So I don't know. There you a go. Whale of ice. Ice cream of it, whales. Ice cream whales. <laughs> what was that laugh? <laughs> <laughs> I like changed bodies for a second. <laughs> Hit that music. will be hosting their advanced NEPA training virtually on August 23rd from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. This workshop will benefit those professionals who work in related natural resource disciplines, who work with federal land management or real estate transactions, federal agency projects or permitting, and transportation or other infrastructure projects with a NEPA review component. Check it out at www.naep.org. Alrighty, we have no official sponsor for today, so now it's time for Nick's 30 seconds or less funny sponsor go all right laura you know we have you know tea and coffee you take you take beans or herbs and you make them in to a drink and now i have a new exciting way for us to consume vegetables um we're gonna do the same thing with them you know we're gonna be like a corn water uh and our new personal <laughs> favorite pea water it's uh it's this wonderful thing you take peas you put them in a pot <laughs> boil them and then you just drink the water you don't eat the peas you just drink pea water i'm telling you this is the newest thing it's going to take off i see no issues with this at all um it's got a nice light yellow hue to it it's uh, <laughs> get it wherever books are sold i uh yeah pee water for everyone there you go <laughs> someone probably actually do yeah. that <laughs> yeah whoops <laughs> let's get to our segment. sorry so the person that i was coaching she just graduated super smart she's been doing a lot of different environmental things so she's got like a broad base of things but she the one thing she doesn't have is technical writing. So I was telling her that, you know, that's always what you're talking about. And then she was like, well, how do I get that? And I was like, I don't think we've ever talked about that before. So I told her, I promised her that I would ask you, how would someone who is just graduated and looking at like NEPA jobs as a potential option, but doesn't have technical writing skills, where what would she do to qualify to apply for Dawson? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And um Man, there's a lot to kind of unpack there. I'm actually going to start a little bit before graduating. Actually, the very first thing I'll say is that the best way to get hired is network. If you're good at networking, it doesn't matter. If you're good at writing, we can teach you some of that. There's some baselines, you know, natural skill that everyone needs to have. But, uh, you know, we can still teach a whole lot of it. I mean, a lot of the people that come out of college write like they're writing a you know, a term paper or an essay or an article for a, a magazine. And I would say that's, that's great for that, but not at all what we do. And they're very, very different. And uh, the, trying to describe it, I think, you know, when I was writing my own paper, using my own experience, I tried to sound as smart as I possibly could. Right. And I tried to write, you know, really complex sentence structures and really, you know, and sometimes that's, that's what the, it's really more about what your publication is looking for, right? And in our case, our publication is looking for complex topics described in simple and easy ways to understand. So technical writing in that respect is very different from scientific writing. And that's really hard to do without getting an internship, without taking specific courses in college designed to do that for you. After, if you've already graduated and you're like, this is what I want to do. Like I say, again, step one, network. You know, I didn't get hired at my first job because I was good at writing. You know, it, it was, it helped, but I got hired because somebody, a close family friend of mine told my boss to hire me. She's like, he's great. You should hire him. I'll be mad if you don't. Right. Like that's how I got hired on my first job. So, but from there, there's, I mean, there still are courses you can take. Having some experience with NEPA, again, using your resume as a 
I'm interested in doing NEPA. I'm interested in doing and or planning or whatever it is. And, you know, I say we do a lot of different things at Dawson. Sometimes it's like just having an idea of what the company does as well and how it lines up with your vision and all, all that. You get some of that in the interview as well. So, and most people like when they write that come out of college, like you say, we can, we can kind of tell right away. And I think I've even said this to Morgan, like, I'm like, Hey, this is great. Uh, very smart. Uh, maybe too smart. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. I and mean, that was kind of like my experience. And that's what I would say. And I don't know, Morgan, if you want to hop in since poor Laura's voice is still not a hundred percent and see, cause I'm curious what your experience was too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had a similar experience where I came straight from undergrad and then worked in a NEPA based position. And my technical writing wasn't my strong suit because like Nick said, I worked on term papers, our scientific based writing that was a lot more detailed than what you need for NEPA. And my advice to this person would be read some NEPA documents before your interview. If you want to provide a writing sample, sometimes they might ask for one. Uh, Then you kind of already have an idea of what they're really looking for. You're not going in blind and can have just a better idea of the level of detail you need. That would be my biggest piece of advice. And practice always helps. Take the constructive criticism. Once you do get hired, I'm sure you'll get hired somewhere. And uh, don't take it to heart. Just learn from it and try to improve from it. Yeah. Man, that's, that's really good. That's a great idea. I really like that. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because you can, you can see like all NEPA documents. Well, I shouldn't say all, but like, you know, an environmental assessment is a public facing document nine times out of 10 you'll you'll find an ea online for a certain amount of time and so you can actually find them for you can even look for people's names and the document itself because every single NEPA document is supposed to have a list of repairs so you could type my name and you know environmental assessment and we'll see what pops up and who knows (laughs) i'm actually kind of afraid to do that but um (laughs) yeah there's a lot out there (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Nick just took a break. He's like, I'm going to go. Yeah, this I'm up. totally doing it right now. Totally <laughs> Googling yourself right now. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, yeah, just to see if anything pops up. No, there's a lot of podcast stuff. It's so strange. Uh, <laughs> well, that's good. But uh, yeah, so I guess you know, the podcast is bigger than my environmental assessments. <laughs> that's really not saying much. But well, I mean, you know, there, there's advice. definitely ways to do it. And if you know, like, where the company works, who they work with, Knowing, you know, you know, working with the Department of Defense helps, but knowing that they work for the Air Force is more helpful. Knowing where in the country they work is even more helpful than that. So just like I say, research is a great idea. And every interview, you have to do that. It sounds really annoying and really tedious. But if you really want to get hired, you're really, really wanting to look a job, get, get a job. Having initiative helps. Like we just did a round of interviews for a position in Hawaii and the junior staff position, the person that we made our offer letter to told us about the company, told us about, you know, where he thinks his interests are in uh, live based on doing his own research and not just looking at the website. He actually really went through and did some really genuine due diligence on the company. And it was really impressive. It was really cool to see. And I was like, oh, this person really wants to work here. Isn't that something? (laughs) I know. So I don't know if I, does that help? Yeah, that's Laura. awesome. I will pass all of that information along and um, let's get to our interview. Perfect. Hello and welcome back to EPR. Today we have Mike Mayer, a principal environmental project manager at HDR and president of NAEP back on the show. Welcome back, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. But it's, I mean, it's great to have you back on. And of course, I have to start at a very serious and important question. Does anyone ever call you Mike Myers? Because it has to yes. Um, oh, there's Mike Meyer, you know, the Halloween, famous Halloween killer. There's right. Michael Myers, the, the comedian who makes much more money than I do. <laughs> um, Oscar Meyer, if you're hungry. Um, <laughs> it's actually spelled correctly. So, yeah, it's not the first time I've heard Michael Meyer. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's kind of time... funny because the spelling's phonetic, you know, M-A-Y-E-R, just Mayer, Mayer. kind of rolls off your tongue. <laughs> but I, yeah, I always have to stop myself. I'm like, it's it's mayor, it's mayor, it's mayor. <laughs> That's all right. I've given up correcting people. I don't care anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good way to be. It absolutely is. Um, no so, but yeah, you were, you were our very first guest on EPR, which is just so fun to think about. Yeah. Um, we were just talking about how the show is vastly different now than it was then. 
we're better at it now. <laughs> yeah. So and the fact you that your pilot for, didn't get canceled. Right. Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We're good enough then, you know, uh, uh, thanks for putting up with this then and for today. So it's, it was back in 2021. So what's new with you and uh, what you're doing at HDR? Let's see what is new. Well, uh, I spent a lot more time on NEP work uh, for <laughs> sure um, than I did in 2021. But uh, let's see, HDR just working on uh, different types of projects, whether it's uh, water resources and all the environmental compliance requirements and natural resource management. And of course, renewable energy is is big and a lot of money being uh, invested in that. And to most folks, it still requires, you know, an environmental process. So that kind of has kept me busy. Yeah. And and so we'll definitely dive into some of your, your experience in the field in a minute. But uh, while we're on NAP, What's it like being president? I mean, it's, it's everything you'd hoped and dreamed? Um, or oh, for, more? Sure. for sure. Yeah. I mean, just the accolades I get on a daily basis is, you know, from my fans is, is fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, no, I, do get, it, I get spam email from, from fake Mike Myers now. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If anybody out there, I don't ask for money by the internet. Just check those email addresses. It's not me. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's, it's, it's been great. You know, I've only been president since May, so I don't have a long, long reign to reflect on. But no, it's been really great so far and excited to help implement the things that we want to do to grow the grow the organization and provide more benefits to our participants, our, our members. And uh, yeah, so, um, you know, we under uh, Rana uh, Spelsi, who is the past president, we, we established a, a strategic plan to kind of refocus on our mission and improve or increase the, the services we provide and the benefits we provide to our, our members. And so really excited. I'm on the implementation part of that kind of curve. And so working with the board to get those um, strategic initiatives implemented and kind of see, see some changes that bring benefits. Yeah. So what's on the horizon then for NAEP this year? So um, a couple of things are really, so we really kind of focused on our working groups. And so we have, I believe, eight working groups now. They're kind of all different stages of, of getting going, but they're all kind of modeled after our NEPA practice uh, working group. But part of the recognition was that we have a lot of a lot of members with a lot of different interests. And so having these working groups that kind of key in on those interests and allow for more, more dialogue, more collaboration across the country on some of these issues. So for example, I manage the biological resources working group. You know, we have monthly calls like our NEPA practice working group and the others. And really, it's just a way to talk about emerging issues, which there seem to be plenty of these days, and emerging science, whether, you know, whether the issues are regulatory or changes in the science or new, new developments, mitigation or all those types of things. That's the kind of stuff that we, we chat about. Yeah, it's really cool. But we're also, yeah, we're also hoping that the working groups will help us provide more guidance in the conference planning that we do for our annual conference. So speaking of the, the the conference for next year, it's going to be in Minneapolis. The call for abstracts, I think, is going to go out probably in another month or so. Is there a theme this year or is there anything specific think, that we're looking for? I think the theme is how awesome Minnesota is. Um, <laughs> Always. <laughs> so for those who listeners out there, I, I live in Minnesota. So uh, <laughs> that's my bias. No, I mean... I don't know that we have a theme per se, but really want to focus on... Can it be um, like raspberry berets or something? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Someone oh, likes Prince, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Come into our Paisley Park, for sure, where Prince uh, made magic through his music. But we have a lot of, you know, it's kind of interesting. A lot of folks don't know much about Minnesota or the things that we have to offer uh, here in the state. You know, we got a, a couple lakes. Um, <laughs> yeah, one's know. really, really big. You know, we have the Boundary Waters uh, Wilderness Area. And we have, you know, a lot of Native American history here. And it's just a really interesting place to to be in and um, tour. So I hope everyone can come out and, you know, visit visit Minnesota. And they come to the conference in Minneapolis. In terms of, uh, and I, you know, fondly call Minnesota the North. I don't know what Upper Midwest actually is. I don't think it's a real direction. Right. So, um <laughs> So we have the South, we have the East, we have the West, I'm going with North. Yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> so come to the North. I almost guarantee there won't be snow in May, but um, <laughs> don't hold me to it. But right. in terms of, yeah, in terms of like a, a real theme 
I think we just want to focus on getting some really good speakers and having some really engaging tracks. I think the other other thing we want to really do is is highlight the working groups and get more people involved in those so that there's more more of a collaborative nature or collaborative feel at NAP in terms of everyone being involved. Yeah. And to that end, actually, there's also a new working group, the Emerging Professionals Group. I don't know if you can talk a little bit about like what that group is. And, you know, obviously there's a right in the name is who we're looking for, but, you know, considering who listens to this podcast, they may be interested to hear how they can join. Right. Yeah. And so members can join just through the website. You can join any of these working groups in the website. There's a drop down for it and you can join, get on the listserv. The Emerging Professionals Working Group is a great one for folks entering the profession. And it's not focused necessarily on any particular topic other than growing your career and you know things like networking and and reaching out to others that have been in the profession for a while and, and those types of things. And so it's a great kind of place to, I think, talk to others in kind of the similar similar situation in their career, similar phase in their career, I guess. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I would encourage folks to join that one. And and then you know there's no limit on the number you can join. So. If uh, you're an emerging professional and you're also a biologist, come join the biological resources working group. You know, if you're someone who focuses on environmental justice and equity, you join the environmental justice working group. So lots of different ones. Yeah. Yeah. That's really exciting. And like I said, you can check them out at NAP.org. And, you know, it's funny, we, Laura and I were just talking about network. We talk about networking a lot. And so it just, it just made me think like for your career, what has been your experience with networking? I think networking is, is critical. It's amazing how many things, opportunities develop based on who you know or who you met. And, you know, it's the same thing with burning bridges, right? It's Mm -hmm. um, the best advice is to not do that uh, (laughs) unless you're really, really sure you don't want to cross that bridge again, right? Right. Um, But, you know, I don't know how many times it's actually in the environmental profession is is a small world in terms of, of the people in it. And so you come across folks that you meet, you know, maybe on a project. And then three years later, they call you back and say, Hey, I got this other project. Can we talk about it? You know, and, and so that networking is really important and that relationship building. And it's really, you know, you get only get so far in your resume, but you know, it's, it's then comes down to the relationship and how you present yourself in the community, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And to dive into your background a little bit more too, you have a, a doctorate in natural resource and environmental law. Is that, Right. How, how do those two things kind of go together? So I have a JD, a Juris Doctorate. So I'm an attorney, non-practicing attorney. Um, <laughs> We're lucky to be admitting it. <laughs> <laughs> the key is the non-practicing part. Yeah, my, my undergrad and graduate work was in wildlife and fisheries biology. So I have a BS and MS from University of Massachusetts and then decided to go to law school out at Lewis and Clark Law School in, in Portland, Oregon where I got my JD and also a certificate in um, environmental and natural resources law. And so have kind of focused on those two aspects, kind of smashing them together for my career. And so whether it's, you know, I'm a little bit beyond the going out in the field uh, stage of my career, but I used to go in the field and do endangered species reviews and that kind of thing, and then work through the, the federal process using my legal background to understand kind of the changes in the regs or the changes in the law or those types of things. So, um, you know, my parents didn't understand when I graduated from law school <laughs> that the first job I had was as a wildlife biologist, but <laughs> they've, they've since come around. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's that transition coming out of college and then another one that we talk about on the show a lot, transitioning from being a field person to being more behind the desk. Was that hard for you to do? Was it a challenge or were you kind of embracing it? I mean, it, a challenge at times, right? I mean, I think I enjoy my time in the field. I think the field is very glamorized. Um, yes. <laughs> my field experience, I, you know, was often chased out of the woods by gnats and things like that, or black flies in uh, the hills of uh, mountains of Idaho, or my graduate work, why I sat in snowbanks in the wintertime, waiting for some deer to come into some apple bait. So, you know, um, I remember walking. I did a small stint as a contract biologist with Fire Island National Seashore, and we were doing some monitoring in the in the back bay area of the of the island. And I remember having to basically wear in ninety five degree heat a full yeah rain rain gear. Oh gosh! Yeah. And mosquito net 
so that I could go check turtle traps without losing a pint of blood. So, <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's some great field experiences, right. And then there's, you know, some real field experiences too. So, <laughs> Gosh, that's too funny. so yeah. yeah, I, you know, I got to the point in my career where I could kind of pick which ones I wanted to have, which I yeah. think is always the, the best place to be. Right, yeah. Oh, is this one? Is this one in Hawaii? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Happy to go. <laughs> is this a helicopter survey? Sure. I'll get in the helicopter and go do an aerial survey. Yeah, that sounds great. I yeah, gotta walk yeah, yeah. into that muck for twelve miles. Yeah, I think I'll pass on that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this new young employee we hired. They'll do great. They'll do great. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. yeah. That's too fun. You've also, I guess, you've lived all over. I feel like is that is that fair to say for you? I have. I have lived all over. If you just count north of Interstate 70, I have like a, <laughs> a heat threshold I can't tolerate. You know, oh, that's super I used to, yeah. I used to joke I couldn't live where cactus grow naturally. Um, <laughs> so Denver is probably in Kansas City is as far south as I've lived. But yeah, I grew up in uh, in Massachusetts. Lived in Oregon for a while. Lived in Denver. Lived in the UP, Kansas City. So now, now, uh, mm-hmm. now Minnesota. Beautiful. Lived in North Dakota for a little bit as wow. a field biologist, yeah. New York. So yeah, I've made my rounds. <laughs> well, I mean, like I said, I know you, like I said, you have this background of uh, being a field person, be, being having this environmental background with a law degree. So definitely want to ask you about the changes that are coming for the Environmental um, and Endangered Species Act. But maybe you can give our listeners just a little bit of background of, on what it is and how it works. The Endangered Species Act? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, for folks who are are new to this particular law, it was passed in 73. It was the third attempt to pass a law to protect uh, species from extinction. And so it's pretty much landmark legislation for species and habitat protection. Species are, if they're in a decline, they can be petitioned to be listed as either threatened or endangered. And it's uh, threatened of becoming endangered if they are endangered of coming extinct. And also they can, so it's regulated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service or NOAA Fisheries or NIMFS, however you want to use their acronym. So NIMFS basically watch or regulates the species that are conserved species that are marine or anatomists like salmon. So in the Northwest, NIMFS is, is, uh, manages all the salmon stocks. Whereas Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, you know, regulates all the terrestrial species. And there's a couple of funky species. So like NOAA manages uh, turtles when they're in the water. When they come on land, they fall into Fish and Wildlife Service's jurisdiction. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there's some, <laughs> some different things there. But basically, yeah. it makes it illegal for anyone to take uh, listed species. And take means, you know, harm, harass, kill, trade, capture, all those types of things. But the federal government federal agencies are all have a requirement to use their programs for conservation of, of listed species and to consult when they propose an action that could adversely affect a listed species. And so um, it's often called Section 7 of the Endangered Species Act and is what I've done a lot of, of work in. If you're a, a private company or you're a private party who may re, you know, have an activity that will, that will result in taking, incidentally, uh, taking an endangered species, there are other permits you can get through Section 10 of the Act. And there's also permits in Section 10 for experimental or scientific research and those types of things. And it's a process for, for going through that and getting those permits from, from either of the services. Yeah. And um, it's funny because I think uh, we think take, and in my, in my mind, I've had people ask me this question many times, like, what does harass mean? Where is the line on what is harassment and what isn't? And how do we manage that when we talk about take? Right. Yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, it's harassment is as the <laughs> Fish and Wildlife Service special agent tells you it is. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> you looked at but it. For, yeah. But for me, it's if you're interfering with any of its kind of life history traits. So if what you're doing is interfering with this feeding or it's uh, reproduction or it's denning. So you're disturbing it, kicking it out of its den. All those things are kind of harassment in my mind. And so it's something that the species is requiring extra energy that it wouldn't have to expend because of something you're doing. So when we go through the consultation, you know, an adverse effect is 
is a pretty a no effect is a really hard determination to get to. They're having no effect. Usually, no effect is the species isn't present, right? right? And then there's a very not likely to adversely affect is one of the other other findings, and that's also very hard or supposed to be very hard to make that determination as well. And so, really, it's it's that harm and harass part that gets most often to that you know like the adversely affect the species kind of area. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's good. And it, t- it totally depends on the species, right? I mean, so you're talking to something that is wide ranging and is very used to, is habituated. So very used to, you know, humans and, and development that that harm harass is going to be very different than a secretive, you know, more secretive species that has a very small range and is very specific on its life history needs just based on tolerance and, and those types of things too. So it's really species specific. Oh yeah. Yeah. Which makes total sense. So, you know, that's a little bit of the background of the, the act and what it's designed to do. So what's changing with it? What's coming down the line? Sure. So we saw a lot of changes to the regulations back in 2019. And that was under the previous administration. And this administration has revisited those changes and is proposing uh, new ones. Uh, we also saw there's a court case as well that occurred and required Fish and Wildlife Service to list things a little differently. And so we're seeing some regulatory changes associated with, with both those court, court cases as well as what came out of the previous administration. So one of the, one of the big ones probably is, so there was three, three proposed rulemakings put out in June. The comment period wraps up uh, in about three weeks on August 21st for folks if they're interested in, uh, depending on when this airs, if they're interested in commenting, there's still some time. But so two of the rulemakings were put out uh, jointly by Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries. The third was just put out by Fish and Wildlife Service. And this was kind of a response to what they call the, I'm trying to blank, the blanket rule, excuse me. Um, and <laughs> that's, that was kind of funny. Yeah, the um, blanket rule. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, so historically under the law, when a, a species is, or the regulations, when a species is listed as threatened, it typically also requires a uh, 4D rule. So 4D is just section four of the act and subsection D, because technically under section nine, which is the prohibited acts section. So that is what were all the things that you can't do, you know, take, harm, kill, all those things. Those are really for endangered species. And so when a species is listed as threatened, they don't automatically get the same protections as one that is listed as endangered. And so a 4D rule will outline those things that are considered take or threatened species and things that are, are allowable. Fish and Wildlife Service historically has just, when they list a species as threatened, applied the Section 9 endangered species protections to them and, you know, as a blanket policy. And whereas NOAA hasn't, NOAA, when they list something as threatened, they issue a 4D rule at the same time for it. And there's a little bit of difference in workload, I think, in terms of listing species, which is probably why Fish and Wildlife Service does it that way. I'm not sure that that is the reason, but that would be my guess. And so the case basically found that Fish and Wildlife Service needed to do 4D rules when they list something as threatened. And so the regulations also, in, back in 2019, restated that and required Fish and Wildlife Service to also issue 40 rules when they list threatened species. So this revision to the regulations is really going back to the, the approach that they used to have, where they would, when they listed something, uh, apply the uh, Section 9 prohibitions for threatened species as a blanket. So that was probably one of the bigger changes. They still have the, you know, they have the discretion at any time to list that for make that 40 rule for a threatened species. Right. But it's a timing thing, right? It takes time to rulemaking isn't quick. And so, you know, if, if species protection and conservation is the goal, waiting for rulemaking to happen on a 40 rule may not be in the best in interest of the species. So the blanket rule really helps provide that protection the moment they're listed rather than waiting for a 40 rule to be developed. One of the interesting things too, is there was a recent case that came out of, it was a Maine lobsterman case against NOAA fisheries. And it came out of the DC circuit. And it was actually found that, you know, a lot of the times the agencies will give the benefit of the doubt to the species. Uh, when in doubt, you know, species gets the benefit. And it's based on some of the legislative history of the act. 
And the court found that no, actually, the species don't get benefit of the doubt, which I thought was really quite, as a biologist, alarming. Um, yeah. <laughs> when we're talking about species on the verge of extinction, that you know we can't give them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, I guess the response or the solution is then to you know amend something, amend the act or something to make it more specific that they they will. And and this was really about when there was when there wasn't a lot of data. So it was a right whale case. And there was an increase in right whale mortalities. Um, right. And the right whales, you know, they uh, very North Atlantic right whales. There are very few of them out there. They have mortality associated with getting um, tangled up in fishing gear and also boat strikes, vessel strikes. Yeah. Um, and so that's what was the basis for kind of this this court case was a biological opinion. And no, it didn't have a lot of data. And so they... And I'm totally paraphrasing, but they basically kind of had some worst case scenario options in order because they didn't have the data. And so they were giving the benefit of the to the species and the court rejected that approach mm-hmm. saying that the law doesn't do that. So, yeah. So anyway. So, so what happens to the right whales then? Are we just going to keep everything as is? Is the case over? Or is this part of what the comments are changing? These regulations don't go to that topic. The court just basically said you need, you know, you need to use the data you have to make these determinations. Data is really hard, right? When we're talking about endangered species. And it's even harder when we're talking about species that when they die, they sink. And you don't (laughs) don't know that they've died, right? And so so there's a lot of challenges there in terms of trying to come up with some conservation policies to help species recover when you have very limited data sets. There'll always be scrutiny about the data. Yeah, one hundred percent. And what you can actually tell from it, right? Right. Yeah, man, that's, that's, that's very interesting. So the comment period will still be open when this when this airs. And I want to know, like, who? So who can comment? Uh, why should people comment? Uh, oh, sure. Like voting. Yeah, yeah. Any, anybody can comment. You know, it's open to the public. So, and I just talked about one provision. There, you know, there's some other provisions too. So, um, endangered plants actually got a little bit of a boost in the regs, which is kind of nice. So, mm-hmm. plants. Endangered plants are only protected, um, historically have only been protected on federal lands. And so they weren't protected on private or, or state lands or anything like that through the federal protections. But they extended some protections to uh, endangered plants so that if they are on non-federal lands and taken, collected or, or foraged or whatnot, if they're on state or private lands in violation of a state law or a state trespass law, then those federal protections can apply. So that's a little bit of a change, which is which is good for plants. Um, yeah. All my botanist friends out there, um, <laughs> there are some some changes to critical habitat designation, especially if it's unoccupied. They did some changes to some of the definitions associated with the interagency, the Section Seven consultation I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to get some clarity from some confusing text that was there before. So there's some good parts. There's some not great parts, in my opinion. But but yeah, it's open for public comment, and so. You just go on to the website and get in and comment online. And what what happens afterwards? So they get all these comments, right? And then and then what? Yeah, so a rulemaking, they'll get all the comments off to analyze all the comments and respond to comments that, you know, are substantive in nature and which could affect the final rule, right? This is just a draft rule. So they're looking for comments. They want some insight from others. And so they'll respond to those comments in developing that final rule. And so then that final rule will be published in the Federal Register as well. Yeah, perfect. So once the final rule comes out, all the language will be super clear and we'll never have to do this again, right? Is that... Well, that would put attorneys out of out of work. <laughs> what are you going against attorneys, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's too funny. All right, I'll ask you much, a much easier question then. Do you have a favorite endangered species? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a crazy, weird question to ask, but uh, one that, yeah... It needs a little highlight or a little uh, like doesn't get the respect it deserves or something. You know? Oh, so I'm a, I don't know. My background has always been in big mammals and, and, you know, as a deer biologist, graduate student anyway. And so I'm a big fan of grizzly bears, mm-hmm. big fan of wolves. So those are, I guess, you know, some of the ones that I like, love the marine mammals too. So unfortunately, you know, for polar bears, they're yeah, probably so. a ticking clock, but. That's also up there in terms of some of the favorites. So, yeah, I'm, I'm near, uh, what is it, charismatic 
mega megafauna yeah. <laughs> fan. So <laughs> no, I got you. I mean, the, the, they save many species by being even having one of them protected. So yeah. exactly, yeah. Things with big home ranges tend to help other things with not so big that aren't as cuddly and cute. Right. Right. Um, well, maybe not cuddly. But well, cute. I mean, I once met a grizzly bear at a zoo. It was in a holding cage and it was like <laughs> monstrous. The biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and it had the cute little like button ears, you know, it's a grizzly. Uh, yeah. It's adorable. And he was so hot. He's like, please just let me out. I promise I won't maw you to death. <laughs> I look at his paws and his finger, his, his, his claws are bigger than my fingers. And I still can't I, get over that. Like, it's just yeah. like, oh, right. <laughs> just All right. Well, they're, they're big diggers too. I mean, that's right. They're yeah. digging for roots and things. So it's part of their claws. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. Salmon, <laughs> catching some salmon. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not just salmon, but, uh, wait, does that mean you, you vote every year in like the, uh, fattest bear contest or is that like, uh, I have, I have before. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a fun contest. I like that. Yeah. Fat bear week or whatever it's called. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. too fun. So, I mean, there's other things that are going on in the environmental space, obviously, like you say, we've, we've talked plenty in the show about, you know, NEPA changes that are coming, that have happened and more that are coming. And then, you know, we had the Sackett ruling as well, which is basically changing the way we do wetlands in this country and kind of going back to a simpler model is the simp- is the nicest way to put it, I think. But do those tie into what we're talking about with the Endangered Species Act as well? Is it all kind of happening uh, in a similar way? Does Sackett, um, is that going to influence how we manage endangered species? There's a lot of, of talk about the interrelationship between the SAC decision and, and the Endangered Species Act, especially when it comes to Section 7. So Section 7, as I mentioned, is the interagency kind of consultation portion of it. And so if you need a permit from a federal agency, they need to go through Section 7 consultation, which then extends that protection basically to the permittee. And it's an easier process and more streamlined process than that permittee getting a Section 10 permit and going through the habitat conservation planning process and and NEPA associated with that. And so one of the things is is that a lot of projects where there have been wetlands, potential wetland impacts, and require a a Clean Water Act Section 404 permit from the Corps, then they get that Section 7 consultation coverage. Now, with um, less of those wetlands being considered jurisdictional, that number will likely decrease in terms of those projects that can use that that federal nexus, as a lot of folks call it, to get that Section 7 coverage for their projects, requiring folks to then, private industry and others, to go out and get that Section 10 permit instead, which can be more of a time-consuming process of, you know, a couple of years to work through that. So that's the, from an Endangered Species Act standpoint, that's one of the things that we colleagues kind of see coming down the road is, is less availability of that Section 7 process for non-federal agents, agencies, the permittees, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's, man, I keep telling people it's it's the oddest time to be in environmental policy, and I mean it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It's changing all the time, it's trying to keep up with it. You know, like you mentioned, the NEPA Phase 2 regulations came out last week or so. Maybe it's been two weeks now. Looking through that, we had the, you know, the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023, which was the debt limit ceiling increase, right? which amended NEPA, mm-hmm. provision, yeah. I think it was provision three or something, made changes to fundamentally to NEPA, the law. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. Yeah. I still can't believe that happened. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it, it got through without a lot of discussion because of, you know, how it was included in, in the need to raise the debt limit, yeah. the debt ceiling. So, yeah. So lots of changes in, in the things that we do and how we do it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> that just means we'll have to, uh, if they, you know, say when, when all this gets sorted out, we'll have to have you back. But, you know, so we're getting to the end of our time, but we, lo- we do love to ask our guests about hobbies. We did ask you about yours last time and, and you were in writing was the one we, we talked about. Is there a new hobby or do you have any more updates for us on how your writing is going? Let's see. I am still writing. I am not publishing or selling, but I am writing. <laughs> um, so, so that's fun. And it is a hobby. And so I joked earlier, so I wanted to see if we can get the uh, Colbert bump from EPR. Uh, <laughs> and so one of the things I need to do, and this is totally not me, this is me speaking for myself, not representing any organization or a company other than myself. And so one of the things I found I need to do is, is actually generate a following 
And so on the platform that previously was called Twitter, um, <laughs> uh, see from Minnesota, it's, you know, the artist who's <laughs> known as Prince. Right, um, right, right. <laughs> if folks can connect to me, I will, I will connect with them. My Twitter handle or w- whatever it's called now, my X handle. Um, weird, yeah. Yeah, right. Is at M Stone Mayor. So M S T O N E M A Y E R. Yeah. So reach out. That'd be great. And then I can convince my my agent that I have a following and she can convince publishers that that'd be fantastic. So <laughs> was, put a test to uh, test the audience out there um, there about that. But uh, no, I'm still writing. Scuba diving is another hobby. Homebrew oh, yeah. is another hobby. So um, wait, wait, wait. Where do you scuba dive? I don't, I don't do those together. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> um, we, like I mentioned earlier, we have some lakes here. And so it's mostly lake diving. Um, mm-hmm. Superior has a lot of shipwrecks. It's just really cold. So diving in Minnesota is not for the faint of heart um, <laughs> at all. And we also have a lot of quarries. So Minnesota, uh, for folks that don't know, has a big mining history. And um, so we have a lot of quarry, pit mine, quarry lakes that has really clear water and some interesting things. Sometimes, you know, construction companies leave their bulldozers when they pull out and, and go dive and look at stuff. Other people push cars into these things. So there's always something to see. Yeah. People are great that way. Yes, they are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it'll be a little chilly, but it'll be fine. You didn't ask me about my, uh, my field st- story. Yeah, that was the last thing. I mean, you told some earlier, so I was like, maybe he's already done it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have a more, field more, story more. That's, um, that doesn't want to make people run screaming from the field? Is there, is there one of those or is that so, or is it uh, more I mean, of the same? Oh, good. Oh, and, no, it, was the best one. One. it was a funny one. And so um, it was when I was doing my master's work and I was doing white tail deer research. And so I'd have to go catch them and put radio <laughs> collars on them uh, and that kind of thing. And I was trying not to use any kind of um, drug to sedate them just because they can have some weird reactions. And when you're working yeah. in suburbia, this is in suburban Massachusetts. Last thing you want to do is have a drugged up deer walk out into traffic. So, right. um, So we were live catching them basically using nets and uh, we'd use, we'd use (laughs) rocket nets. So it's this big, long net. It's about uh, 40 feet by 50 feet or something. And we would use rockets to shoot over the deer. (laughs) Right. And um, so we have these bait piles of apples and get them coming in all the time. And so then we'd set up the nets and the rockets and catch them that way and basically (laughs) net deer. And so I, I had to get a bunch of volunteers and so the people that came to mind right away for network were my fishery biologist friends because uh-huh. they're really good with nets. And so they came out to help me. And I remember it's kind of crazy because you have this like little detonator. That's like the old World War II kind of, you know, yeah. <laughs> detonator thing. And I remember crawling out in this field and I had two deer on the bait. Or three actually one out ran the net. And so I, I launched the rockets. The net went over them. One was a doe a pretty big doe, uh, female deer for those who aren't deer folks. <laughs> right. Um, and what was a fawn? So a baby, I was halfway out in the field. All my volunteers are at the edge of the field. And so I got to the first one and basically what you got to do is it's like, um, uh, tap roping almost where you gotta, you gotta wrestle the deer to the ground cause it's up and kicking in the net and then you hobble it and you blindfold it. And once you blindfold them, they just calm right down. Like they can't see anything and they get, pretty relaxed, but getting to that point can be, there's a lot of hoops that are, <laughs> that are moving and they're pretty sharp. Um, so anyway, so I get out there and I, and I was on the doe, I was the first one getting her down. And the first volunteer ran by me to the fawn. The second volunteer ran by me to the fawn. The third volunteer ran by me. To, I'm like, come on guys, this is one's much bigger. <laughs> you can help me. And then one of the guys that I had working with me, he's a, he's a friend, big guy, bigger than me, like just muscular. And, um, I remember he got his hand, his finger pinched between, he was working on a fawn and he got his finger pinched between the front hoof and the back hoof of the fawn and sliced his finger. Mm. Mm. And so from then on, I just gave him a hard time about being beat up by Bambi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that's yeah. so great. And that was a, that was a fun moment of field biology for sure. Uh, yeah. Wow. Like, so like, okay, when you're firing the rocket, do you say, did you like say something cool? Like does the on you or like, you know, like also the Vista or something, you know, like there had to be like an action word that you used. No, you didn't do that. No, no, not that first time. It was yeah, more like, yeah. I hope this works. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise I've spent a lot of money and time out here trying to uh, 
trying to catch these animals. Yeah, so, man. Well, that's a great story. That's a great, <laughs> a great field note uh, to add. That's going to be list. one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's quite incredible. <laughs> Rocket deer uh, <laughs> in theaters now. Please don't um, try this at home. <laughs> no, 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 please don't. Uh, oh, this was I would say it was professional. professional, but I was a student, so I can't even say I was a professional. Yeah, <laughs> so, well, yeah, semi pros. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I watched a YouTube video on it. That's too funny. Well, Mike, we we are out of time. Is that before we let you go? Is there anything else that but that we didn't cover that we wanted to? I don't think so. I just want to make sure that. Um, folks think about coming to Minnesota in, in May next year for the conference. And uh, I think it'll be a great time to, to visit the North. And if you have mm-hmm. extra time coming, you know, stay a week longer, go up North and into the boundary waters or, you know, other things that we have to do in this, in this state. So I just encourage folks to come on out. Thanks for being on with us, Mike. Hey, thanks. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate this podcast. You guys are fantastic. And that's our show. Thank you, Mike, for joining us today. It's always a pleasure. Please be sure to check us out each and every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. See you, everybody. Bye.